He has an extensive resume. I'm warning you. Jeff works in the business of life sciences. He now serves as executive director emeritus of the Alliance for Building Better Medicine, which accelerates the development of advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing and R&D in Richmond, Petersburg, Virginia. Basically, improving access to safe, effective, and affordable medicines. As a volunteer, Jeff serves on Board of Directors for Virginia Bioscience Health Research Corporation, the Advisory Board for the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute, where he chairs the Technology Transfer and Commercialization Committee, Virginia Commonwealth University Innovation Gateway Technology Review Committee, and on the board of Grow Capital Jobs Foundation in Go, Virginia, Region 4. Jeff served until 2019 as CEO of Virginia Bio, the state trade group of life sciences industry. Virginia Bio connects and supports universities, companies, entrepreneurs, investors, clinicians, and patients to accelerate the discovery and commercialization and clinical application of bioscience products and services. Before leading Virginia Bio, Jeff was a co-founder and served as VP and general counsel for Lyotric Therapies, I hope I said that right, in Ashland, Virginia for 10 years. This small specialty pharma company used its proprietary formulation technology to create new drug products for license and commercialization by mid and large pharma. Previously, he practiced law in Richmond, Virginia, focusing on new technology companies formation, international business, and intellectual property transactions. He counseled multiple biotech companies, including university technology spinouts, and managed the firm's China practice. He holds an AB cum laude in government from Harvard, a JD from University of Wisconsin Law School, and an LLM in public international law from the University of Virginia School of Law, where he was a Ford Fellow, Ford Foundation Fellow. He serves as trustee on the Raymond James Charitable Endowment Fund, and he served on multiple boards in leadership of, of nonprofits, including the Pediatric Project, Virginia Repertory Theater, Wintergreen Music, Second Presbyterian Church in Richmond, Virginia Law Enforcement Assistance Project, and others. And he generously volunteers with ministries helping men who are transitioning out of prison. Whew. I warned you, he has an incredible bio, and when I was telling them, as we were walking here, he said, Kelly, it's really about the other people and the work they do. So I just wanted to tell you, that's the kind of guy he is. He is a remarkable, well-rounded, very busy human being. And he's obviously driven to improve not only his immediate community, the state of Virginia, but he impacts the entire world's health. So thank you, Jeff. Last night, I enjoyed getting to know Jeff and his wife, Kathy. Where's Kathy? There's Kathy. Um, Thank you for making the trek from Virginia, and it's truly a pleasure to have you here this weekend. So, on behalf of the Chautauqua Women's Club, the entire Chautauqua community, Jeff, we're honored to have you. Let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Jeffrey Gallagher. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank Kelly and the Chautauqua Women's Club for this opportunity. And this is my National Park reusable water bottle. So, which my wife reminded me I should take. <clears throat> the mission of Chautauqua is to explore the best in human values and enrich the lives of the communities that we touch through exploring important issues of, um, and stimulate provocative, thoughtful involvement in creative response. So I say, are you ready? Let's do this tonight, okay? Let's do this. The way that medicines are made and distributed in the United States and around the world is not working well. Actually, it's an extraordinary, if underappreciated, problem, taking a big toll on human health and wellness, causing significant economic burden, 
great risk to our public health and to our national security. In the United States, we face both episodic and chronic shortages of many important medicines, and we have for decades. The FDA on its website for 30 years has kept a list of drugs in short supply, which numbers in the hundreds. Hospitals have battled a problem of an inadequate supply of essential medicines, the ones that they need even to keep their OR uh, rooms operating. COVID only underscored all that. Um, many hospitals in the country couldn't get the basic muscle relaxant they needed in order to intubate the patients in those first few months who needed that, that acute procedure. And it also impacts the care that we all receive in many different ways. You may have read in the Times over the last couple of months the delays and gaps in um, uh, chemotherapeutics uh, on the marketplace and how that's delaying treatment and putting people off their regimens. Antibiotics like penicillin just announced within the last month is going to be, we're going to have problems with the supply of that coming in the fall. Simple saline solution even is something that hospitals cannot rely on a constant supply of right now. And it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality of the medicines at issue. You may have read or be personally involved in the problems of the supply of the ADH medication Adderall over the last 18 months. Um, the supply's been reduced, you can't get all the right dosages. New supplies are coming in from other places and the potency of those new supplies is uneven and it's really wreaking havoc on the uh, regimens of the patients who need those drugs, whom, as you know, it's a finely tuned drug that sometimes takes months and years to achieve that potency and that efficacy. The Adderall supply is a mess right now. And it's also, of course, the cost, right? The cost of medicines. Famously, medicines um, are a great um, financial burden and the financial burden means inaccessibility to medicines uh, for many people. Price is the leading cause of non-adherence to prescriptions and to the courses of medicines doctors recommend, re uh, recommend, and that takes a toll on health. Insulin, for example, studies show that a sixth of all the adults in the United States who take insulin, and that's 1.3 million people, either don't take it, delay the taking, or to take less than they should because of the price of the insulin. All that's in the United States. Imagine what it's like in the rest of the world. Those societies make few of their own medicines. They lack the buying power that we do in the United States or, and the technical resources and the regular, regulatory capacity to, um, uh, to check the medicines that are coming in. Uh, there are scores of studies, including by WHO and JAMA and others, which demonstrate that 10 to 20% or more of medicines purchased by lower and middle income nations of the world are substandard or even falsified, 10 to 20%. And modeling estimates that 100,000 children die um, each year from pneumonia due to substandard and falsified antibiotics. And in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa alone, over, there are over 100,000 extra deaths from malaria because the medicines that they are taking are ineffective. The tragedy is borne not only by individuals, of course, in their communities, but by local and, global, local and global public health, as ineffective dosing regimens are known to cause the rise of new drug-resistant disease strains for the world. Well, what is going on? 80% of the medicines that we take in the United States are made overseas, or the components from which they're made are made overseas, and principally from China or India, and if they're from India, probably the raw materials came from China. Over the last 30 years, the world's manufacturing capacity, including that in the United States, has fled overseas to, these, to those low-cost producing nations because of cost pressures here at home. Cost pressures, um, and also uh, environmental and FDA regulatory pressures. In those nations, the cost of compliance with the local regimen is not as high, and, um, and they're at arm's length and farther away from the FDA-type regimens in the United States and Europe. Frequently in those countries, the investments to build those plants, quarter of a billion to a full billion dollars, were undertaken by their government. So the price of the drugs that's being charged doesn't have to recoup that CapEx charge. 
It's an imbalanced uh, competitive scenario, but that is where we find ourselves. And with a, with a manufacturing medicine so complex and so regulated um, and so regulated that to create new manufacturing capacity takes a long time and a lot of investment. And so when there's a blip in the supply chain, which in another industry uh, might easily be filled by other manufacturers or new manufacturers coming in, can't be done so well in pharmaceuticals. Well, with the supply cost and quality out of our hands now in the United States, the result is decreased health and wellness, at-risk public health in good times, as well as times of crisis like COVID, and of course, our national security as well. Fortunately, we're waking up. The nature and scale of the problem is becoming more widely known and starting to be addressed. But remember, the underlying economic and political causes of the problem still exist. So whatever solution is going, to have to, is going to come about, if it will, is going to have to be radical. It's going to have to deal with the underlying economics. As FDA Commissioner uh, Robert and Caleb said, we have to fix the core economics if we're going to get the situation fixed. And radical solutions are emerging. Innovators across the United States are pivoting their focus on developing new chemical, engineering, manufacturing technologies. Just as important, we're seeing innovation in business practices, in, so in social organizations, and in public policies brought to bear on this. The goal is to reshore the manufacturing of quality, affordable pharmaceuticals to the US in a way that's economically and environmentally sustainable to create a secure, resilient domestic supply of essential medicines, and also to enable the global regions of great need to purchase or to make their own quality essential medicines with these advanced manufacturing processes themselves. The ultimate result, patients will receive consistently higher quality, breakthrough affordability, and a dependable supply. So I've been fortunate over the last four years to work with many of the universities, researchers, private companies, nonprofits, and public organizations leading the way in forming an emerging cluster of ideas and manufacturing capacity and research of, in, of innovation in central Virginia, along with others in the nation. And I want to share some of the story of these remarkable people and their inspiring work. There is hope for real change. But first, I need to just get a little technical for a few minutes. I promise this is peak technical, maybe four or five minutes, but it'll really help in understanding some of the things to come. Uh, in the world of medicines can be divided into two types of medicines broadly based on the active ingredient in the medicine. One is small molecule medicine, the other is large molecule medicine. Large molecules also called biologics. Up until 30 years ago, we couldn't make the darn things because they're just so complex, we had to put, we, we learn how now to put DNA inside of a bacteria or a yeast and they make it for us, but we, we just can't make them. But we can make small molecule medicines, and small molecule medicines we make through synthetic chemistry, the kind of chemistry you were taught, um, you, were, you were taught, and that m the chemical industries of the world are all, all abound in. It's a little bit like tinker toys. You take one molecule and you strip off some things you don't want and you put another molecule atom on and you do that again and you do it until you get to your target. It might be 10, 20, 30, 40 different steps along the synthetic pathway and that's how you make it. We can do that. We can do that. Small molecule medicines are not small though in the impact on our health and on global public health. More than 80% of the medicines the world takes are small molecule medicines. And although they're the first ones and now the biologicals have come in the last, Still, 80% of all the drugs the, the world takes, every generic, by definition, is a small molecule medicine. So if you're taking a generic, you're taking a small molecule. Two, of the la two out of three of every drug approved for the last several years by FDA is a small molecule. The two therapeutic drugs for COVID recently discovered and sent around the world were small molecules. So it's a very large part of the medicines we take. That's what we're talking about today. That's what my, the group of people I'm working with, not the large molecules. I got to know that. Next, uh, when you have a medicine, we take a pill or an injection. Um, what we're taking is what's called a final formulation. Well, that's made of that special molecule called the active pharmaceutical ingredient, 
which has the uh, biological activity, and then a lot of other things we call excipients that trick the body into accepting that API and allowing it to work effectively. So finished formulation, before that is your active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is the, the key. Active pharmaceutical ingredients don't rain down from heaven. They're made from key starting materials, 500 to 1,000 of these, uh, uh, which are sourced around the world, mostly now in China and India. And we take those in different combinations to make the API. And then one step before that are the raw materials that make the key starting materials. So the end-to-end -end chain of manufacturing a small molecule drug is raw materials become key starting materials. Those are remanipulated in synthetic chemistry to become an API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, and that's encapsulated in the finished formulation that we take. Might be an injectable or might be a pill. Uh, finally, um, uh, in manufacturing, as many of you know, there are two basic processes that uh, can be used. One is called the batch process method, and the other is continuous processing. Um, is, the, is the sound still good? Did it, something happen? Um, um, uh, uh, in, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, um, the batch process is used as it was in all the other chemical uh, manufacturing industries until the last several decades. They have all innovated on into the use of continuous process manufacturing, a, a technique that FDA just yearns that we can get to. But it's quite complex, takes a lot of data, but it makes better results more quickly uh, with uh, higher quality, more rapidly, scalable from low volumes to large volumes. We haven't gotten there yet as a pharmaceutical, indus as a pharmaceutical industry for reasons I'll discuss in a second. But there's batch and there's continuous and that's the one that we're yearning for. Okay, now, let's enter the story. And I'll do it by introducing perhaps the indispensable character of the story, a gentleman named Frank Gupton. He's accomplished an accomplished industry veteran in pharmaceutical manufacturing. He helped design and bring online in 1977 perhaps the last um, state-of-the-art API manufacturing facility in the United States built by a European company when we're still manufacturing things, uh, things here. It's in Petersburg, Virginia, a small town just down I-95 from Richmond. Uh, for decorated, it operated and was star of the, of the international, uh, of that inter European company. But in um, 1987, it was shuttered as part of the stampede of US facilities that fled to China and India. Um, for Petersburg, it was another death blow to their economy. It's a, Petersburg is a majority minority community where just over the last three decades, it's one after another after another industry leaving and nothing coming back in. And, um, and that, Frank took that occasion. We're gonna switch to this. Okay. So, turn that. Excuse us. Let's, hello, hello, hello. Just speak more loudly. Yeah, that's the technical problem we gotta deal with. Um, and Frank decided uh, to retire. And just days later, he was recruited by Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, 28,000 student R1 public institution, which had a great engineering school, but no chemical and pharmaceutical engineering department. Could you start the department for us? And he said yes, uh, not only enthusiastically, but with an attitude. And Frank's attitude was this. Having spent his life in the industry of pharmaceutical manufacturing, he realized just how inherently conservative the industry was because of the double hit of being highly regulated and also being an industry so dependent on patent protection to make the dollars to recover investment. And so while he saw over 30 or 40 years all the chemical manufacturing, all the other chemical manufacturing, there's food, uh, petroleum, paints, et cetera, innovating, 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 none of it was happening in pharmaceuticals because um, there's only a certain amount of patent life you know, because FDA regulates not only the final pill that comes out, FDA regulates what we call the CMC, chemistry manufacturing controls that create the pill. So when you go for an approval of a, marketing approval for a drug, 
you have to show all the way that it's made, all the processes, all the, all the machines that check it, all the people who check the machines. And it's a, quite a long process, it, um, takes a lot of time. So you tend to use, pick off the shelf processes that have been used in the past and approved by FDA in the past. That's the quickest way to get it through. You know, if you're a young buck engineer and you come and say, I've got a better process for that boss, boss is gonna say, how long does it take to get it approved? Well, six months, and they say, get out of here. So what we have in the medicines we're made now, small molecule medicines that we make and take in the is probably these are made by processes that are 50, 75, 100 years old. I mean, they work, but there's a big unrealized upside, Frank thought, in scouting out other industries, bringing a new attitude, you know, with some young students who don't know any better, bring an industry and in, in academia, a couple of disciplines from academia, let's see what damage we can do. Um, let me shoot to uh, a great moment. One day in 2011, one of Frank's uh, neighbors was riding on an airline flight from somewhere to somewhere, and he happened to sit next to somebody, and they got talking, and it turned out the guy he sat next to was someone who worked for the Clinton Foundation, which was helping the Gates Foundation supply $5 billion worth of drugs every year to the lower and middle income um, nations of the world so that they could fight malaria, TB, and HIV. And um, Frank's friends started bragging about him. And they exchanged business cards, and the next day, Dr. Gupton got a call and said, how quick can you get to Seattle? And that really starts the ball rolling on the story. As they talked, um, uh, Frank said, well, his young team had taken uh, the drug Nevirapine, one of the drugs in the HIV cocktail, and uh, we'd taken this 20-step uh, uh, synthetic process of making this drug, and we got it down to about seven steps. And uh, that means 50% of the uh, inputs, 50% of the cost, time, 50% of the waste, yada, 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 yada. And uh, the fellow from, uh, the people from Gates said, well, nevirapine is one of the drugs that we give, give away. If you could reduce the cost by half, we could give the same amount away for the same amount of money. And they said, we're going to give you certain, we're going to give you a grant. See if you can do that under the scrutiny, you know, of serious people, not just in your academic lab. And I'm happy to report they came in under budget and hit their goals. Uh, it was a lucky do it for a second one, a malaria drug under budget, hit their go all their goals, blew them out of the water. And a third one, so three strikes and three home runs for the Gates Foundation, which led them in 2017 to provide the establishment funding for what's called the Medicines for All Institute in the College of Engineering at, at VCU in Richmond. The idea being here, are the next two dozen drugs that we distribute around the world for free, try to do your magic on those. You, the way you will leverage the global pu public health effort in this world is uh, uh, immense. And so they undertook that and so Quickly, those, those, um, those targets uh, were, were accomplished. Um, Nevirapine itself now on the world market is at a price about 23% less than it was the day that Dr. Gupton met the folks at Gates. That's the world market price for it. And um, the, uh, Gupton and his team have won the Green Engineering of the Year Award from the White House, from multiple chemical societies, and uh, great things are happening. Now I want to bring in a few of the other major characters and their storylines uh, who are very important. Um, Ampac is the name of an API manufacturing company uh, that found a way to stay and to continue to work in the United States by exploring advanced manufacturing over the years. In 2016, because their business was increasing, they decided to buy that mothballed plant in Petersburg, Virginia, it being the most state-of-the-art of all the places available and brought it back online with investment, in part because it was near Dr. Gupton and they began to explore with him the new technologies for manufacturing. At the same time, hospitals across America uh, goaded a bit by philanthropies and foundations began to think about how can we organize differently to solve this chronic problem of a lack of an adequate supply of essential medicines uh, that we need to keep our hospitals operating. And they formed a very innovative innovation uh, organization called Civica, C-I-V-I-C-A. 
It's a nonprofit member organization of hospitals that take care of about a third of the beds across the United States. And they thought, well, at first, the very least we can do is we, we can merge our buying power, make long-term contracts, go right to the manufacturers, pick out the good manufacturers from the bad, and that'll help us smooth the, su the supply ups and downs. And that worked to some extent, but they always had a hidden possibility. Maybe we should have to become manufacturers ourselves. At that same time, at the federal level, you know, FDA is uh, on top of all this stuff. They know what's happening, the cost of medicines. They know what's happening, the quality. They know that the manufacturer's gone overseas, and it's very difficult for them to regulate it as effectively as they can United States plants. You know, part of the scheme of regulation by FDA in the United States is they can drop in at 2 in the morning and do an audit on you, and you always know that's a possibility. Well, in both China and India, they do do audits, they didn't do one from the start of COVID for two and a half years. They do do them, but you have to give a couple weeks or a month's notice according to treaty that we've negotiated with those companies. So it's much different to feel that same level of comfort and scrutiny in regulation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, they know that out there is this continuous process that we just can't reach based on where we are in the manufacturing industry right now. Um, Medicare and Medicaid are experiencing huge costs as our private insurers as well as individuals for the cost of the medicines. That's bringing political pressure. We've all read about that. The Commerce Department is saying all our manufacturing is going abroad. How can we bring it back, especially into communities that have been historically disadvantaged and, and excluded? And last but not least, the player I want to introduce is key members of the orphan and rare disease community. You know, orphan rare diseases are ones in which the incidence or prevalence is sufficiently low, say under 25,000 cases, new cases a year. And the problem for these uh, patients is that even when we have, even when we are aware of medications that could help them, the medications are rarely available because um, it's not economical to make the investment and the, get the FDA approval to make them and to supply them, right? So these low volume medications are uh, relatively scarce. It's a big, big, big problem. In particular, Children's National Health System in Washington, the institution in the world which sees more children with rare disease than any other, gentleman Marshall Summer, who runs a program there and was head of NORD, um, met with Dr. Gupton they brought in um, a very talented serial entrepreneur, an MD, PhD, Eric Edwards from Richmond, who's started some companies and was quite interested in looking at this possibility with them. And together, they came up with a business plan and a technology plan. Okay, Dr. Gupton's accomplishments in making and intensifying chemical engineering, the process, are so great Maybe it allows a categorical jump to this continuous processing kind of method that FDA has been asking for. All right, so that's where the deck of cards is, and then it's squeezed really hard because COVID hits in January 2020. The nation and policymakers realize this dangerous mess we've created for ourselves in um, not just in um, uh, supply chains broadly, but in medicines and the public health and the national security implications. And the White House coordinates a federal initiative to secure the nation's supply of essential medicines. They grasp what's going on, they reach out to the innov innovators, they find Gupton and many of the others that I've mentioned, and they put together an unprecedented um, con federal contract through BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Administration, issued to a spin-out of VCU, which has the right to Dr. Gupton's technology to create continuous flow uh, processing, Flow Corp was the name of the company, to do it in tandem with Ampac and with Medicines for All, and with Civica, which invests $150 million of its own money deal right alongside several new manufacturing facilities, its own injectable drug uh, facility, it's a uh, manufacturing facility itself. It all comes together. There's also a vision for a strategic um, API reserve 
in this country, we do, have a, we do have a finished formulation strategic reserve of medicines, like our strategic petroleum reserve. But it's just a fraction of anything we could use. It's only a small spectrum of the drugs we need. And it's extraordinarily expensive because, you know, a, a, a finished formulation of a medicine has a shelf life of six months, a year, 18 months. They've got to uh, be tossed, and new ones have to be bought. The, the innovation here was, OK, the API from which the finished formulation is made. You can store that at a, at a cold temperature. It can last 10 or 20 years without degradation. So what if our strategic approach to having enough medicines we need for times of crisis is rather than storing the finished formulation, storing APIs for the full range that we need and building right beside them the manufacturing facilities that can immediately turn those into those finished formulations? One third of a billion dollars, and if they meet their milestones coming up very shortly, another third of a billion dollars with a couple hundred million dollars of private investment around that. Separately, at, you know, in response to that COVID smack in the face, a group of folks in the Richmond Petersburg region who were aware that this was beginning to happen and um, offended that COVID was trying to snatch so much away from us said, um, let's just get together and try to create a strategic plan, if we can, for the region, for um, the economic development units, for the cities and states, for the, uh, for the universities. How can we possibly help create the infrastructure, that interstitial material of human talent or of water and sewer, or what do they need so that we can accelerate their success? created a large, uh, great plan. Hundreds of people came together on very short notice, got funding uh, from the state to help move some of those ahead. So two separate responses, largely juiced by that slap in the face that COVID gave us. So let me just quickly now go through, over the last three years since then, what's happened in this little area that I know of by these wonderful people. Well, the nation's first and only strategic API reserve has been built, filled, and is operating. Ampact has expanded the plant that it re rehabilitated. It's twice uh, expanded it, invested almost $100 million, and hired another 250 people to increase its work. Flow Corporation is close to completing the manufacturing of its Kilo Scale-Up manufacturing facility right on site. Flow Ampac and Medicines for All have worked together and have, are building out piece by piece that hybrid, a hybrid continuous processing system. Okay, we can't make the leap immediately to this new continuous processing. We lived in batch, but what if just we take module by module and make it continuous? And so uh, we take this process, put in the module we've just completed for continuous work like that, and then have others develop the next module. We will begin to step by step create the solution that the FDA has been looking for. Civic has, uh, is building its fill and finish uh, injectables manufacturing plant. They're gonna open in January, and six months ago they announced that the very first medicine that will come out of the Petersburg plant is affordable insulin, $30 a vial, 55 for a five, five pack. Um, Two lead customers, their own healthcare systems, who said, well, it's not something we usually give in the hospitals. This will have a bigger impact on the people we serve and keep them out of the hospitals. And the state of California, which has been promising to the world for years they were going to do this, they didn't know how to do it, but Civic is going to do it for them. Uh, on the, and then um, uh, workforce programs have been popping up all over with the community colleges, with the universities to go where that hockey puck is going and to give them the workforce that they need. These are high paying jobs uh, in a region that is not used to high paying jobs. And in fact, um, the first enrollee at the local workforce for the advanced manufacturing um, certificate to work at the Civica plant was a single mother of three who grew up in Petersburg and is gonna see about a five fold increase in her income because she's got this job. The research hub up in Richmond has expanded. Uh, VCU is expanding the, its number of programs, its number of students. It's actually bringing under its wing the Virginia State University, which is the anchor institution out in Petersburg. 
it, uh, an HBCU, great engineering school, but nothing in chemical or pharmaceutical manufacturing. They're creating a program together so VCU can be in the specialty that's taking off as well. Um, the state of Virginia has funded with $5 million a new pilot project to try to take these uh, great inventions that had been uh, focused on making the API, taking it back a step further to the key stirring materials. I mean, imagine this end-to-end -end is a bridge across the Grand Canyon. Even if you fix up two of the four sections, if you don't set the other, fix up the other two, you're, not a, you're a little better off. But you still have some of that downside risk. So the, the region's moving into KS, discoveries of, in KSM. Congress has authorized the FDA to create centers of excellence in continuous process manufacturing. They've been trying to do that for 30 years. And Medicines for All, well, Medicines for All got a second round of funding from the Gates Foundation to, um, to work with global public health organizations, not only to increase their uh, pharmacopoeia, their list of drugs that they've helped do, but also to take the new uh, condensed and continuous slow methodology and, for want of a better illustration, put it in a 20-foot container so that you can deploy it to, they're working first with South Africa and the nations around it. If we can get into the regions of the world who have been unable to get uh, the, the medicines they need and have the buying power and the, and the rigor uh, to be good buyers on the world market, let's help them be able to make, say, the 25 most essential medicines they need in that region by themselves. We can automate the system well enough, train enough of the people so they can be in partial control of the supply of the medicines that they require. In addition, new collaborators are in the mix all the time. There's an organization called USP, United States Pharmacopeia. Some of you may know it. FDA is delegated through legislation, or Congress is delegated to, uh, le le through legislation to USP the power uh, to create all the standards by which medicines are judged. So what does purity standard have to be? What's, what can be its uh, acidity or alkalinity when it's in solution? The machines that make it, what can be the tolerance for them? USP sets all the standards for these. And USP has seen, wow, the birth of a new industry of continuous processing is coming on. We've got to be down there. And they've opened a research lab um, in Richmond. And Walmart, you know, the third largest prescribed, the third largest filler of prescriptions in the United States through Walmart and Sam's Club has made a, um, a company-wide commitment, $300 billion over the next 10 years to reshore the manufacturing of, in five key areas of their products, and medicines is one of them, and Richmond is a place we're gonna, we're gonna make that investment and work with us. And finally, uh, the, we create a new children's hospital coalition, which will return to that original dream that Flo and Children's and Dr. Gupton had, which was used to create that BARTA project and return and bringing low volume formulations to pediatric rare disease. Um, on the little group that we set up regionally, um, it just so happened that another uh, federal organization, EDA, Economic Development Administration, issued a historic grant called a Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And so they looked, scoured the nation for 20 regions that were you know, developing emerging clusters and advanced technologies that would be competitive globally and really help us in strategy and security. And our region was fortunate to win one of those. And so with federal money and local matching and state money, another $125 million injection into workforce programs, into water and wastewater improvements done in Petersburg, into new lab space, all the things that we'd identified in that strategic process would help the actor succeed. Well, that brings us up to date and progress is well underway. And so now the last couple minutes, I just want to hold up a couple of uh, reflections for your consideration. First, <clears throat> what a window into innovation. Um, I've come to embrace the definition of innovation as looking at the same things others do, but seeing something different, uh, combining known elements in a novel way to accomplish different results. I think that's what we're seeing. And, and when it's done, solutions to seemingly intractable problems can be just around the corner. 
here, as I mentioned earlier, it's innovations not just in technology. Technology is great. I love technology, but it only take us so far, right? It's the tech innovations in technology, the, the continuous and the, you know, the microprocessors and the data loops and the new, you know, nano catalysts and everything. But it's innovations in business structure as well. I mean, we have a nonprofit manu uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing company, Civica, member driven. We have a B Corp, business corp, um, where the double bottom line, not only of profit, but of impact on society, Flow Corp is uh, organized as a B Corp so it can complete the fullness of its mission as it, build, as it builds out this plan. We have one of the gro great global philanthropies that not only gives the money, but as, as, as um, Gates is known, I mean, they are relentless in their pursuit of innovation to make it effect, cost effective and have the impact that they said they would and meet your goals. All these folks inventing new ways to organize ourselves. And at the communal and the, and the public policy level, you know, this regional collaboration we have, which is called the Alliance for Building Better Medicine, created in the region's strategic plan, winning that big federal grant. Why? Well, you know, it's people who don't usually work together, trying to work together because they see a good that's bigger than, that's so great that everybody loves it and it's bigger than anyone can reach itself. That's the way you get collaboration. And then at the public policy level, these federal agencies thinking of ways to do things that had never been done before. There's just innovation all around and that's what's made it happen. Second reflection, um, Collective response and thoughtful involvement has to be provoked, provoked. Um, it really was the COVID slap in the face. And as I've done my work to help bring these groups together and help move them along, you get in the face of people and you share with them just the facts about, I mean, did anyone here know the depth of the problems we had with our medical supply chain? how it came to be and how close we are really to a, a, a real public health and national security disaster. You know, the, the accumulation of headlines is enormous. Well, if people stop and pause, people respond. People respond. Most, believe, most people, I think, believe that it should be done and it can be done and it can be done and it should be done for everybody. Not just my family member or the lucky few who have access because of accident of birth or social standing. That is, I think, what my third reflection is. In the deepest sense, where does this all come from? I think it comes from this. From what I'm observed, the human heart longs to play a part in the healing of the world. This long is so strong that once it's evoked, uh, it can overcome our personal and our systemic barriers to change and practical obstacles along the way. And it happens not just in spite of, but uh, really even more strongly when deeply challenged by something like a, a COVID threat. Finally, the last personal reflection. I believe we are created with a purpose, call to co-create or sub-create the world brought into being and called good by a creator. Our call is to serve, to help build the kingdom. Yeah, it's to take our part in our, the healing of the world. Tikkun Olin is a, a phrase we use in the Jewish tradition, in the Christian tradition. I think Jesus showed us on his journey, he'll stop to heal anyone, and we all should do that. Everyone we, need, we meet on the road deserves healing. And if we pursue that call, even in difficult times, and even to audacious visions, occasionally we discover, as I have here, that lots of saints and heroes are in disguise as regular folks among us. And that we have a God who provides far more than we can ever even ask or imagine. That's my remarks, thanks for your attention, and it's a good time for questions. Yes, I'm an insulin-dependent diabetic, and the patent on insulin was issued 100 years ago. How can drug companies charge such exorbitant prices 
for such a medication that was, quote, yeah. invented 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so you're, by the tone of your voice, you're asking in a way that goes to you know, who we are as human beings and what we can do rather than the dollars and cents and the, and the business of it. And there's no answer, I don't think. I mean, they, everyone can come up with a reason for it, but not a reason that's compelling and allows it to continue. And I hope this will help change all that. Yeah, I mean, great. I mean, 100 years ago and deeded over the patent for a dollar and it's public, it's public knowledge now. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, I still pay in my copay more than what I would pay if I went across the border to Canada to buy my insulin. So it's, you know, and I know many, I'm from Buffalo, so I know many diabetics uh, that have to do that. Yeah. They oh, have gosh. to go to Canada to buy their insulin. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry that that situation exists. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. It is. I say it in words, and you said it in better words, so thanks. But it, how can they legally do that? I mean, uh, we live in a free enterprise society, yeah. and technically, there, since there's no patent, some other drug company can make yeah. insulin and charge less, right? Is right, that? yeah, yeah, no, that's true. And insulin can be harvested, you know, from animals, or it can be manufactured now through biotechnology. Every insulin uh, uh, that's offered on the market has, has to go through an approval process, right? So there's some investment and in some of this and that. Um, this is complex. It takes time to build it up and then to take it down. These are all just market inefficiencies, though, but they don't answer the very basic problem. Why haven't we come up with a solution for a drug so widely needed with such immense repercussions for human health that we've streamlined that, um, that just, uh, you know, whatever goes approach to an approach that really delivers the medicine you need. Okay, yeah. we're going to move on Thank to you. the next question. Thank you. Ah, hi. Uh, you cited an example of, of an AIDS drug that the continuous process manufacturing could produce, I believe, 23% lower yeah. than the world market price. Do you have examples of other drugs with similar impacts? Yeah. Um, Great, thanks. The drug I was referring to was Nipiravir, and it was one of the HIV cocktail drugs. And, um, and that drug now uh, is on the, the world market price, price is 20 some percent lower than it was before this all uh, began. I, I need to point out, that's, that was a cost reduction still based on the old batch processing method, but with all the great uh, things that uh, Dr. Guppen was able to intensify the process. And when that goes to continuous, it'll be even a bigger cost drop. Now, the other medicines, uh, they've done, by now, I think a total of 10 different medicines that Gates has and brought to scale through other players and is beginning to arrange for manufacturers around the world. And there are TB medications and anti-malarial medications, as well as the other two drugs of the HIV cocktail. And it looks like the numbers on those uh, will be similar. There'll be that kind of cost reduction. How did uh, Canada negotiate lower prices for drugs on the other side of the border? Well, um, so, first of all, I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert in this. I do know that um, in the Canadian system of health, there's federal dollars are sent into the system to support pricing. Uh, all along the way, and I know that's true of their medicines as well. I don't know what the cost structure is of Canadian manufacturers for the medicines they, they make. I don't know if you're suggesting it that they get a different, get to buy at a different price, say, from a U.S. manufacturer than others. Um, if they're buying from, say, China and India, I just don't know what their prices are compared to others. I think, um, I think what happens is that in this country, um, there's a greater return off the price of drugs that are sold to the companies that are selling it that there's in Canada. And in addition, I think in Canada, there's a subsidization, subsidization goes on. But this is an area that is not in the middle of my expertise. But a good point. Okay. Um, oh. e Eli Lilly is forced to reduce the cost of insulin based on the re uh, government regulation right now. And I don't think they're hurting. 
My question is, don't you think we would be better off if we had a national health care where manufacturing was based on need instead of profit, so those at the top are making millions and gouging the people on the bottom? Yeah. Well, I know an awful lot of people uh, think that way. Um, it's a complicated system. That sort of really large policy structural thing is a little bit beyond the purview of what we've been working on, but um, there are compelling reasons to, for that. Um, I did, you heard from my bio, um, I did cut my teeth on the sort of innovative part of the uh, pharmaceutical uh, area where you're finding new targets and new molecules, et cetera. So I do know a lot of the work and investment that goes into that. Uh, so that needs to be put in the conversation. But here we're talking about looking for innovation, not where it was tr has sort of uh, traditionally been, been sought in new drugs for n new targets and new indications. But okay, all the things we already know and do well, let's just do it a whole lot better. We haven't thought about that on the manufacturing and supply end for 50 or 60 years. Hi there, I guess my question is a bit related. And do you have any sense about, to, like to what extent does our crazy health insurance system contribute to the prices yeah. of medication? Um, I think in the sense that <clears throat> um, the, the, the cost and the pricing of medicines is about as intransparent as, a as anything that word can be applied to. Uh, in fact, it's probably like looking through uh, a couple of um, you know, county fair looking glasses that distort things to try to get, I mean, who can tell what things really cost? I will say one of the commitments of Flow and of Civica and some of the early producers in this new innovative way is complete cost transparency on that, what they're doing and pricing at cost plus. Mm. But there are so many intermediaries, both in our insurance pricing, um, public and private, which combine, and also um, in the PBMs and the people who get us the drugs, it's, um, right. well, in this country, we, 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 there aren't even good records on how many of our drugs come from overseas. This is the, these are estimates even by, you know, the head of FDA goes in before Congress and has to estimate within a band of 10% how many of our drugs are being made overseas. So we're not good record keepers. Um, yeah, perhaps that might be a bit intentional. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. okay. You're welcome. I'm wondering if the science of a unique formulary for this patient being cost effectively produced is something I'm going to see in my lifetime. Yeah. 71. Yeah. Um, where are the academics that are studying? varied formularies and whether they are more effective for patients. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If there are any such proofs, mm -hmm. you know, when are we gonna find the time when you go to the pharmacist yeah. and they say, oh, we have type A, type B, and type C of that thing. Right. Your doctor forgot to tell us which one he wanted. Uh -huh. May we do a genetic test on you and we'll give you the right one or whatever. Yeah. No, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so super personalized medicine, uh, you know, pharmaceutical medicine. Um, two things. Um, uh, number one um, is in some areas, as you may know, um, that's occurring now, but not at the individual unit, but in the category unit, right? So we now know there's not just one kind of lung cancer. There are 27. And if you have one type, the other 26 medicines are not going to help you. Will it ever get down to an actual individual level? I, I just wish I could bring some light on that question. Um, but I think when we're here, uh, so is that going to be a manufacturing issue, you know? Um, I, think what, I think the great gains uh, that these folks are discovering and other colleagues around the country, and there, there are other academic centers and research and companies doing this, can make advances in those areas where we can make even tiny, even individual or small dose 
um, at a, at a, scalably at a decent price. Long way off, but it's, I think, within the realm. <coughs> Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for all of this information. And by the way, I was one of these people who had to pay $706 via Medicare for uh, an EpiPen two years ago, which was, this is through Medicare, but that's not my question. I was in a state of unmitigated shock by that. Yeah, uh, I'm wow. wondering if people who can't afford it, what in the world they would do, because I was here in beef season and I have a... An oh, gosh, yeah. But my question is, as a retired mental health professional, who um, worked, um, you know, at least in a mental health clinic with severely mentally ill patients. And um, as you well know, um, the Thorazines and the, some of the old, old, old drugs from the 50s, patients were put on it and it stopped them from hallucinating. But in fact, most of them went off it whenever they had the opportunity to do that because of so many of the side effects. What is being done in the pharmaceutical industry to encourage more uh, drug research into the manufacture of drugs that were, are relevant to this not small group of severely, persistently mentally ill individuals? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you were first. In, you were the very first person here, weren't you? I, we met over at the table. I remember that. So. Um, uh, I think expenditures uh, at the deep research side of, of medicine discovery uh, have never been greater in the history of our country. Um, and um, uh, at, the, at the risk of um, putting myself in a quadrant of where people stand on this stuff politically and economically, part of the, part of the funding for that research is from the companies themselves as well as NIH. So I think there's a lot of research going on. I do not know about your area in particular. I do know that broadly mental health is an area of, of research and drug discovery, which the, at least the private sector believes is an area that's growing and should have more attention. And part of that is because the payers, the insurance companies and, the, and Medicare and Medicaid are hearing what the physicians and patients are saying and saying, boy, that impacts the quality of life and a lot of things down, a lot of other aspects of physical health downstream. So that's a, not really an answer to your question, but it's the best shot I have it from where I stand. And best of luck, too. One more. Okay. One more. Last one. So you spoke of the continuous process and Congress, and so I'm curious if there's things you know that are. Uh, being worked for Congress where I or we could advocate to our congressional representatives to help support your, your work. Yeah, well, thanks. Oh, That's well. very nice of you to mention. Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, the role of federal policy in driving this forward is, is absolutely critical. It was seminal because of that BARDA grant. And, uh, and the EDA grant, and will continue to be because we're trying to create new systems here. We're trying to break down a system that hasn't been working and, and innovate it. So um, let's see. Um, continued recognition and, and, and uh, funding for programs which acknowledge and address that this um, medical supply chain horror we have here is both a public health and a national security issue. Senator Warner of Virginia, who's really concerned with national security, has a number of pieces of legislation to get more funding for uh, the various folks that can do that. Second, the FDA um, Centers of Excellence of Continuous Processing Manufacturing that um, were, they were authorized to start last year by Congress. Actually, they didn't get any, they, they got only a small amount of money appropriated. It was planning money, not implementation money. And so that's gonna come up before the next Congress to get funding for that as well. I think the final thing is that um, anything, any, any, any move in, uh, say, in the Medicaid area, um, which actually turns our attention to are people actually able to purchase and take effectively the drugs that they've been prescribed? If not, what are the barriers? Oh, one of the barriers is cost. And let's um, find uh, innovative ways to approach that. I think that would be the third helpful thing. All right. Okay. We're done. Okay. Good. 
So let's say thank you to Jeffrey Gallagher. Sorry about the sound system. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.